Mrs. Device, after he retired for one year from the service as a bird colonel, uh, he, he was picked up by Texas A&M as the chief of uh, what the hell is it? Telemedicine. telemedicine, director of telemedicine for Texas A&M University. Fantastic. One year later, running back and forth to Washington, suffered a massive heart attack. Uh, for which, not coincidentally, but his daughter, just uh, three months ago, 26 years of age, passed away at the age of 26, cancer of the brain. On top of that, I break my leg in femur. She winds up in the hospital for 30 days with a massive blood clot around the spine. Uh, my daughter undergoes brain surgery. Thank God that's successful. And on top of that, my great-grandson being born, still born after nine months. Just only about uh, two weeks ago. So somebody so up there has family has had a black cloud on his head for a long time. Yep, we're we're rolling. Okay. Okay. Anyway, this is the good news is my daughter's operation a week ago, brain surgery, the trigeminal neuralgia was totally successful at the local hospital, and uh, it's a very rare operation to go in through the skull, but thank God one it's shed of light came to the family. That's great. Again, it doesn't do it. No, right, right. Harry, they want to start. Okay, ready. They want to start. Okay, this is an interview of Harry Love, uh, Freeport, Long Island, um, approximately 845. Uh, it is August 9th, 2002. The interviewer is Michael Russell. I'm just going to ask you some basic questions at the beginning. Uh, could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Okay, Harry W. Love, born October 18, 1923, Bronx, New York City, New York. Okay, um, could you tell me your uh, education prior to joining the military? Education was uh, four years of high school, graduated at Christopher Columbus High School, period. That was my formal education. Okay, um, did you have any jobs, formal jobs? Uh, uh, prior to entering the service, I worked as a uh, a carpenter's apprentice. Basically, that was my uh, job prior to the service, between mm -hmm. the age of 18 and 19. Okay, um, could you tell me what you remember about when you heard, where were you, and what do you remember your reaction toward hearing about Pearl Harbor? <clears throat> well, I was 18 years of age at the time. <clears throat> working in construction on defense houses, if I can recall, in Britain, Connecticut. And uh, I was home for that weekend, and when the story broke, to the best of my recollection, uh, it was a shock, but I didn't even know where Hawaii was, to be honest with you. Never mind Pearl Harbor. And J Japanese, to me, they were, they, all I knew about the Japanese was that they made rotten tin toys. So it wasn't, it wasn't as magnanimously revolting thing as if some small country did something to the United States of America, which is invincible. But basically that was my first reaction, because I, I, I made little of it at 18 at the time. And whether that be true or not, today it would be a different story, naturally. Did you volunteer or were you drafted? I volunteered uh, uh, November. 13th, 1942, at Grand Central Palace, volunteered so I could go into the Army Air Corps. I, I was just turned 19, uh, and I uh, figured it was time for me to do my bit for my country. Why did you pick the Air Corps? I was always fascinated, the time I was 10 years of age, with airplanes. I would walk from Pelham Bay section to Bronx over the Whitestone Bridge, 1939 to go to Speed Boys Airdrome to just to touch an airplane. It was fabric covered at the time. And just always had built model airplanes things like that. Had you ever flown in an airplane uh, or anything? Prior to the service, negative. <laughs> okay, now, uh, since this is your story, I'd just like you to start it whenever you, you know, went into service until you left service. And just tell your story. I may ask some questions in between, but this is your story. <coughs> Well, uh, as they say, I'm a company that has for public speaking, but that's not the truth. Uh, <clears throat> it's a long story. <clears throat> I don't know how much time I have, and I don't know if I'll tell Well, you, you know, the, the highlights, what you well, think are the important things. Well, from, from, 
November 13th, I listened and I uh, actually ended uh, on, the, on the 16th of November 1942. Uh, my then girlfriend at the time, my wife, who I've known three years prior to marriage even, I married 57 years, that makes it 60 years that I've known this girl. Uh, she met me at the Grand Central Terminal, took the Long Island Railroad out to Camp Upton, uh, Camp Upton, which is Yapank. From World War I, they had that same thing. Yapank, and I stayed there for about 10 days, and from there I was uh, transported down to Miami Beach for basic training. And I got a little basic training there, held my first rifle at the time for two weeks, and three days of KP, didn't like that too much. After that, I selected or took a choice and took armor in school uh, in the Army Air Corps and sent me to Buckley Field, Colorado, where I spent about 10 weeks in armor in school, which was fine. Ready to graduate, when I was offered uh, to take gunnery and get three strikes very quickly. That time, what, what did you do in armor school? What that is uh, learning about the 30 caliber, 50 caliber machine gun synchronization on putting the uh, weaponry in P-38s, P-39s, uh, synchronizing the shots to go through propellers, uh, inside and out the weaponry of the 30 50 caliber machine gun. Those are the basic weapons of the Air Corps at the time. Psychiatrist and uh, uh, spoke to each one of the, the armament people whether or not they'd be interested in going to gunnery school because at that time there was a great demand for saying life expectancy for a gun at that time was about, well, two and a half minutes or something ridiculous. But I volunteered because they we were offered stripes right away. I sent to Tyndall Field, Florida, <coughs> Panama City, and where I got my sergeant stripe as a gun. And from there, I was offered the opportunity to go to aviation cadets. Everything happened very quickly, and I accepted that opportunity. Went to Santa Ana, California. Uh, from there, well, prior to that, I, I got basic some basic college uh, training at Washington State University. Uh, I got years credit there, but probably about three months. And uh, Victorville, California, was bombardier school. I got my commission there in May of 1944. Very quickly from that point, uh, leave. Uh, we sent to Lincoln, Nebraska, and from there down to Alexandria, Louisiana, for uh, connection with a uh, crew, where my crew was assembled other than a navigator. No navigator at the time, so the bombardier would act as navig navigator too because we had dead reckoning and, and pilots navigation. And I flew two or three months as a navigator bombardier in a B-17. My crew was assembled there total, and a navigator came aboard for the last three weeks of training. And from that point, back to Lincoln, Nebraska, we flew overseas. We had some harrowing experiences overseas, going overseas. How did you travel? Was that what was your route that you okay. flew? Okay, basically from Lincoln, Nebraska, we flew to Bank of Maine, Goose Bay, Labrador, Reykjavik, Iceland, and from there on to England. Going from Goose Bay, Labrador to Iceland, we had left Goose Bay, Labrador with a 70 to 80 mile an hour tailwind and route the wind completely changed which is a quick story and it reversed itself to an 80 to 90 mile an hour headwind so we were off on our ETA for about almost an hour <coughs> the pilot blamed the navigator we didn't see any Iceland and we all really had a hot time there for a while until I, I took the liberty of grabbing the northern bomb site and took a fix on some white cap waves down at about 50, 100 feet off the surface. And we made a triangle situation with the bomb site, found out that the wind had completely reversed itself. So the ETA was changed dramatically by at least almost one hour, which was frightening when you're flying figures, you were taken going up to the North Sea, because at that time the Germans was uh, fixing in our, our radio beacons and men were being flying off course and ditching right in the North Sea someplace out of gas. But we landed safely in Reykjavik, from there we flew on to England. Okay, when, were you, were you, where were you stationed in England? What was your unit that you were assigned to? Assigned? <coughs> I was assigned to 390th Bomb Group, 568th Bomb Squadron in Framlingham, England, in a small county of Purim, Purim, Framlingham, England, where uh, we were at about 
18 miles north of Ipswich, about 35 miles north of London. Direct route from the V1 and V2 bombs, you'd come over nightly. You'd see them come over the buzz bombs, they call them. Uh, it was a direct route from uh, the place where they were uh, lifted off, up in the Netherlands someplace. <coughs> it would, I forget the name of it now. And it would, they'd come right across our base. They would, as long as the engine was going, they were in good shape. When the engine stopped, you know it was coming down. Uh, basically, uh, our duties there was we flew many practice missions with the uh, different equipment that we got given, and we assigned an aircraft. The aircraft we were assigned, I have a photograph of that if you want to see it, so, uh, it's called the Silver Media. It had a lot of missions behind it. Uh, we shot it many times, but it was a good flying aircraft. So the plane already was named before you? Oh, yes, it did. It was named because it had flown many missions prior. So, so the plane you flew over on, you didn't get the Oh, no, we flew over a brand new aircraft with no, practically no armor at all. It was a brand new P-17 flew. We thought that was going to be our craft, but no way. And uh, we got the older unit, which is fine. It was a P-17G with the chin turret, which is always concerned about it wouldn't be the one prior, where the bombardier had a single uh, 50 caliber out the nose of the craft. The other came out G, came out with a double twin chin turret. <clears throat> so this is the plane we flew, our practice missions, practice bombing missions, and uh, Ostensibly, it was about a well, about three-week period of, of indoctrination in, in the, the combat formation, flying, etc. We started flying. Well, that was August, September, about September, I guess. And uh, we started flying our first missions right about thereafter. Um, <coughs> numerous missions I flew, but. The first mission I recall is the Berlin mission. It was the very first one they called the Big B. And naturally, as a rookie crew, you flew what they call a coffin corner. They put you always in the back, and that seems to be the place where most of the flak was hit. We were, we were okay, though. We got back safely, a little bit of flak holes, etc. <coughs> well, missions thereafter were basically, which I won't go into missions because there are so many missions. You've got heard of a thousand missions. But one or two in particular, and the last mission, I think I'd go right to that if I could. The last mission was a mission to Castle, Germany, which ostensibly was a milk run. What do you mean by a milk run? Well, a milk run was one of the, one of the missions that you won't get too much enemy fighters. At that time, the P-51s were doing a hell of a good job in protecting the bomber formations, P-47s as well. But the P-51 was the first plane, to my knowledge, that was able to escort a bomber formation from England to, to Berlin or wherever, which is deep into the heart of Germany, Regensburg or Augsburg, and tap back to England. Or from Italy up through into Germany and back. A note there, yes, and the, uh, the P-51s that were flown by the, the Black Flyers at the time out of Italy, a very true story. A lot of times people don't believe it, but it's very true. And they had never lost a P-17 bomber on any missions they protected. <coughs> Conversely, uh, when many more planes were flown out of England, we lost planes even with people who want a fighter escort. But not that many. When they flew with you, they did one heck of a job, our little friends. Mm. Wonderful feeling to see them come out of the sky when the uh, Messerschmitts and the Apocalypse 190s are coming in. And there above you see a bunch of these wonderful P-51s flying old men in their 19 to 20 years of age. They weren't called kids in those days at 19. They were there up there flying missions, putting their lives on the line. And to, well, of course, so to speak, today you say, well, he's only 19, he's only 20, he's a kid. No, they weren't kids. The kids on the, on the front lines, the kids that were on the beaches, about 60% were under 19 years of age. They weren't kids. It's just an ad lip I'd like to throw away because I don't, I don't consider when people say, well, he's only a kid, that's why he was drinking, he had an accident. How old is he? 19 and a half. He's not a kid. Most of the pilots, I was a big 20 years old, I was an old man already, flying. My pilot was, they called him Pop, Don Drugan. He was 26, you know, an ancient, oh my God, he's old. My ball turret gunner was 18, just turned 18. <coughs> uh, 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 Stevens. 
I mention his name because out of the whole crew, he was still in the ball turret when we shot down. He had never gotten out, so to speak to his family after the war, it tore my guts out. Anyway, uh, on this milk run, like I say, is a, is a mission <coughs> where it generally had a lot of coverage and it wasn't a high risk, it wasn't as high as if you go to Berlin or Munich or München or Regensburg, Augsburg, or Schweinfurt, they were terrible missions. This was one that you could go with generally configured coming back okay. Uh, I was not hit by flak, I was not hit by fighters. <coughs> we had flak trained on us because we flew too close probably to the Ruhr Valley. Ruhr Valley was called Happy Valley. Happy Valley is where about 90% of believe all the German munitions were, all the German munitions were manufactured and it was well fortified with anti-aircraft. <coughs> oh, you have that picture, picture I said, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, <coughs> anyway, I can recount the exact experience of a shoot down if you'd like. Oh, yes. Uh, about 12 noon, coming back in formation, <coughs> I believe the, our lead bombardier, uh, because of a headwind that hit the group, slowed up our progress and we were supposed to join the rest of the wing. We were behind schedule, so I believe he swung the group more to the right, that would be setting to more north, and it cut just on a base part of the Ruhr Valley, where we should have gone 10 miles south of it, so he'd catch up with the wing at the proper time and all fly back together. <coughs> we were hit once or twice with particles of flak, but nothing traumatic. So finally, one of the shells struck our number three engine, direct hit, and the wing began to vibrate and oscillate. At that point in time, smoke filled the cabin, and you could tell a dying throb of an aircraft. I spoke, called the pilot, he didn't answer me. Now, the co-pilot responded, yes, mom, dear, we hear you. I should bail out, and I heard no alarm, but with that wing, oscillated that much more, and I saw the engineer came down, a fellow by the name of Parker, the sergeant, and my navigator was in front of me, Jerry Wasson. They had to go out of the trap door before me. By that time, I had the engineer kick out the trap door, at least. They refused to go because the pilot hadn't pulled the alarm bell. And again, as a commissioned officer, I took it upon myself to order to go. I could see the wing going about 30 degrees up and down. And planes don't fly good with one wing, as my wife knows, because I'm not flying right here to that day. Unfortunately, at that instant, the wing gave way at about 27,000 feet, 26,000 feet. <coughs> it spiraled down in a leaf-like manner. No centrifugal force could be greater. The only thing I could mention, and it's in my anthology, so I got a copy of it, I could have it. The only thing I could think of as I went down, which probably no other soldier or airman thought that way, they always thought you could get killed, you could get wounded. I knew I was going to die. There's a big difference. Even the men at the beaches in Normandy thought, well, the chance, my, my, the other guys are going to get it. I knew for a fact, and all I can think, what is mom going to say when she finds out that I'm dead? And there's no question in my mind now, the centrifugal force is, is, is monumental. You've been on whips and, and, and circuses, etc. This is 40 times worse. G's were maybe 10. <clears throat> Until finally, as we went down about, oh, I'd say five or 10,000 feet to, to the plane, where the gas tanks, the vaporized gas, the empty tanks, they exploded. Thank God for that and I was blown directly out of the front of the plane, head first. <coughs> I lost consciousness for maybe 10 or 15 seconds, not realizing what, where, or how. I fortunately had my backpack on as a bombardier. I could wear it all the time. If you were navigated, you wore a chest pack so you could take it off and put it on. <coughs> I was a little bit more uh, security conscious, to call it, but I kept the backpack on and the black belt still but I Anyway, uh, nobody bailed out of the aircraft, to my knowledge. 
and I spoke to this day. I, my waist gunner is alive. He's out in Tucson, Arizona. <coughs> my tail gunner is down in Tennessee someplace, I believe. <coughs> He's well up in his 80s. But anyway, when I came to, after this blackout, the first thing I did was, knowing I was free, I grabbed my ripcord and pulled it. Felt no jerk whatsoever. People say it's a monumental jerk when a chute opens. It probably is, but I felt nothing. I was so dazed, I imagine. And I held on to the ripcord. I said, what am I holding this for? And I looked up and there was this blossom above me. And I dropped the ripcord. After that, I said, gee, gee, I got out. How I got out, and I looked around. There was pieces of the airplane burning all around, still coming down. Two other chutes I could see in a distance. And I said, gee, I got out OK. And with that, I saw everything went black or went red. <clears throat> Going through the nose of an aircraft, head face with no helmet or anything, leaves you pretty well busted up in the head. I got no complaints, so I kept my sense so that way I could go back and marry that woman. Anyway, everything turned red on my face, blood powered down. I wiped it loose. I said, oh, at least, at least I see. You know, uh, <clears throat> the, the waste gunner was blown out of the side of the craft, him I speak to. The radio operator was blown through his compartment. Tail gunner went out the tail. Pilot, Lieutenant Don Drugan, Lieutenant Moen, the co-pilot, navigator, Lieutenant Jerry Wassman, Parker, the sergeant engineer, and Sergeant uh, Stevens, the world were all killed immediately. <coughs> and uh, to the best of my knowledge, that basically was what happened to the plane at the time. I landed in, <coughs> in forests, Black Forest, I believe it was, and uh, near a town called Oberursel. I evaded for several days. I had both legs were completely incapacitated. One, one ankle was the size of a watermelon. Uh, my neck was out with a big grapefruit, and I brought along something, a visual aid. I have a bar here that I wore at the time. And it's been checked out. That's the bar I wore. It was hit in the neck by a piece of the shrapnel or the piece of the anti-aircraft. If you hold it hit straight right. up, you'll be able to... It hit. It gives me about a 35% uh, bend. To hold bend that, that can we hold that, my hold that still? here. Yeah. This, this one here. That's the bar I wore. This is the I'll turn it a little bit so you can see it. Can you see the bend in it? Mm -hmm. That's it. I think it's unique because yes. I couldn't understand why this neck was like this. And sure enough, after I, even after I was capped, I didn't realize it a few weeks later until I saw the bar. And then I was told by a, a German interrogator at the time the bar was the bar is broken, something like that. Well, they knew my rank. And I, he took it off and he looked at it. So, then he explained to me probably. Then he, <coughs> there were no medics at the time that I saw, but. Uh, it was just a tremendous, tremendous hematoma on the side of the face. But I was fortunate that the bar was there and it, that I personally believed the rest of my days it saved my life there at the time. <coughs> uh, I was captured by a group of civilians with rifles, barking dogs. I was, I'd made two makeshift crutches. Needless to say, I probably had buried my shoe first as all good amateur instructed to do, <coughs> whatever leaves and twigs you can put on top of them. And uh, anyway, after walking for two days, crossing a railroad track in the morning, about five o'clock in the morning, walking dogs, farmer must have spotted me or whatever, and a rifleman came up, they grabbed me, and <coughs> pushed and dragged me into this town, it was about maybe a quarter of a mile away, half dragged me walking. I wasn't concerned about the military, they weren't there, but they were, I wish they were. The civilians had a high time, high time playing games with me. The women were the worst ones. They, they enjoyed doing a job on me, which is, I could expect that, I'll be very honest. I just finished bombing the city, you know, it's wartime, and an airman comes down, he's certainly not going to give you any <coughs> uh, Cap A21 treatment, and uh, they couldn't understand why we were doing certain things. And, I understood some German, but I didn't respond to them at all. No sense of talking, it was a rough time. They put me in and eventually into a civilian jail. 
where they took all my identification, dog tags, this watch rings, uh, everything I had on my possession off. And all I could hear was spy, because at that time that's one of the biggest threats that anybody had as a civilian uh, jail. And I stayed there most of one day, the next day. And, uh, they did give me a cup of soup and black coffee, Ursat's coffee, I did have that. And uh, they kept saying, you have no identification. And I explained, you took my identification, you took everything. No, you're not a prisoner, you're a spy. <coughs> Through the cell bar in the, in the civilian jail, I uh, observed uh, what to me was a, looked like an Air Force officer, Luftwaffe officer, and it was an Oberst, a colonel. And all I could say to him in German was, Ach bin Americana, Ach bin Americana, Flieger. He looked up at me, went over, left, nodded, walked over, came back about two hours later with a German soldier, a Wehrmacht soldier. And he had me taken out and gave me back my dog tags, my this ring was my engagement ring that my wife had given me six months prior. They gave it back to me. My mother's wedding band, my dog tags, which was very, very gratifying to me because I, I, I didn't thought I'd see any of that back. <clears throat> and the German guard did take me under guard for a day of traveling all throughout Germany back to the interrogation center, which was up in Dusseldorf. And uh, there I spent about six, seven, eight days, about eight days, on the eighth day I was released, where I don't say they beat me, the only thing is they do for interrogation. In my case, the cell was solid metal, it was heat, monumental heat. We'd go up to be interrogated by the officer, and you gave your name, rank, and serial number, whatever you could give them. I did violate and gave him that I was a bombardier because I was wearing the ring, wings. I thought maybe that would shut him up. But back to the cell and more heat. Each day was increasing heat, increasing heat. Last day I'm on the floor for the last day, I was just about to have it. Uh, finally on the seventh day, they released me into a compound where other American prisoners were. Were you fat or given any liquid during uh, this time liquid, at all? Was, was you were given twice a day, you were given a bowl of uh, barley. I think it was like barley soup, like barley and a black coffee, bread you, at night you got black, uh, we called it Schwarzbrot, black bread, and uh, a, cup, a cup of uh, black coffee. Water once a day. Ostensibly that was the food you got. Again, uh, food was not of the essence in your mind, it was just a question of sustaining yourself until the Red Cross perhaps would get in touch, that was a major thing. Uh, <clears throat> fortunately for me, uh, at the eighth day I was taken out of there, and I was taken to one of the populace where there were several other prisoners, and so on. From that point, it was a question of the Red Cross contacting us in a different location, and by boxcar for five, six days, going across Germany to Saigon, which is upper Silesia in Germany, where I wound up in Stala Group 3, an American POW camp. <coughs> it was a camp <coughs> where they had a lot of great escapes from that camp, from that camp. <coughs> we were there <coughs> until early January when the Russians moved in and they took all the American flyers out. It was, say, maybe, maybe 2,000, or 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. <coughs> Told that we were being relocated. And we were on a forced march. At that point, it was the most bitter winter that Upper Silesia Germany had in 40 years. It was a rough winter <coughs> for days on end. <coughs> it was a constant march, walk through the snow fields and snow, hold up in barns or a church, broken down church, wherever they could put it. Tried to try to give us some shelter, but it was just a horrendous, horrendous situation as far as. Uh, on the human body where the German guards, who were generally older Wehrmacht, they were probably World War I retreads, couldn't, couldn't stand up. They were wound up going onto trucks. And for a long period of time, we'd have no guards, except they would, so which way we kept walking, walking, walking. And there was no place to escape to. <coughs> uh, we didn't have to give our bond because, as I say, escape was basically uh, impractical 
to run off into fields at 20, 30 below zero was impossible. We lucky to stay alive together. We sustained ourselves for about 12, 14 days, whatever it took. And then finally the weather started to break. Finally got to a location where they put us on boxcars. Well, that boxcar trip took days upon end. I can't remember how many off the top of my head, maybe eight or ten days. <clears throat> and uh, that probably was one of the worst rides a man could probably have ever have. There's no sanitary facilities whatsoever. Uh, water we got, hot water, we, uh, when the train stopped, the locomotive engineer would let us take some hot water from the uh, tank up front, from his from his uh, local engineer, the the engine. And so we'd have some hot water, and some of us still had some, maybe some powdered uh, uh, coffee or something, or such coffee to make something to drink. We had very little tea at the time, uh, on those 10, 12 days. Wound up in a town called Mooseburg, where the prison camp there, Stalag was 7A. That was a camp, multi, multi-nation prisoners were there. But the American POWs, and the, the officers here, is what Mr. Hitler wanted to keep them separate, which he did. And for all intent and purposes, intended to, to the best of my knowledge, wanted to keep the American officers bargaining chips for some sort of a, maybe, or maybe it was the German High Command, bargaining chips for a, some sort of a better uh, resolution to a cessation of hostilities, because this, he, he was defeated completely by then, this is now April. <coughs> uh, second week in April, orders came that we would be moved again. Just the American flyers, all commissioned over to southern Bavaria, down towards Birch's Garden, to be held as hostage. Information again, which is reliable sources. The German High Command, knowing that the, the war should be over, had to be over because they were, they were completely defeated, refused Hitler's order. And then General Eisenhower gave a direct order to the German High Command if another prisoner would be moved. Every city in Germany that still stood would be obliterated. Now that is not for publication all the time, but that is the story that we all got. Not one of our prisoners were moved. <coughs> Hitler's orders was for his rebuke. <coughs> and we stayed right there till April 29th, when elements of General Patton's Third Army came up from the east, heading west, <coughs> and through Dachau, which is only about four or five miles away from our camp. And <coughs> Very, very happy occasion when they did come through. The tanks circled our camp first, didn't come right in. <clears throat> they circled the perimeter of the camp where the American POWs were, or just the officers at the time, all facing out maybe 60, 70 other tanks. And then came the tank right through the front gate. And <clears throat> old man, blood and guts, was on that tank. And to the best of my recollection, they, somebody said, no, well, somebody else threw it. I said, he threw it. He came out of the tour with a big smile and he had a bottle of liquor in his hand. Scotch. I didn't get any of it. Either. <laughs> and he, and he I hollered out, all I can hear was, here you sons of bitches have a drink on me. And that's because he was the guy that smacked that, uh, supposedly smacked that guy down in Italy for being a coward and something about the story. And he had to apologize to the whole division. He said, here you sons of bitches have a drink on me. And I never got a drink out of the bottle. <clears throat> I tried to get one. And the tank closed and off he went. <clears throat> Actually, a day later we were freed and they were told to stay in the compound. Naturally, as good Americans, you, you don't listen to orders sometimes. <clears throat> I was free and I took a friend of mine, Lieutenant Chester Clem, who lived in Tyler, Texas, and died about eight years ago, wonderful guy. And we went out and we commandeered a uh, German vehicle. That, well, they still probably call them Volkswagen or something, it was an old car, it was running. We had to go see what we heard so much about Dachau. Could it possibly be true with the rumors we heard? <clears throat> All it was three miles away. We got to in about 150 yards of Dachau, which we subsequently went back years later to see. And the MP stopped us. He saw our identification with Commissioner Officer. Yes, Lieutenant, we heard about this terrible camp where they're killing thousands of people. He said, right over here. I said, what's that mountain? I said, that's bodies. I said, what? It was actually a body, 50, 60 feet of mounds. We could only look about 80, 90 yards away. And the stench was incomprehensible. The pragmatic odor, God knows. 
we took test and he said, you want to go in there? I said, no, I don't want no more. I've seen enough. And then I said, what are those other stacks? That's the crematoriums. That's where the bodies were being burnt. And I said, those are the bodies that weren't. They're going to have, we're going to have German forced labor come in from the town and any German prisoners, particularly the <coughs> any Gestapo member or any of the neo-Nazis, they're going to help us <coughs> lie in the bodies and bury them in massive graves. We went back to the camp, we stayed there for about eight days, seven more days. We were deloused completely. And they took us out to a town, I think it was called Strobling, and flew us out in C-47s to La Havre, France. And within a week later, they had us on a ship to John Erickson. Thank you. And they had us on a ship to John Erickson, back to New York. And we arrived back in, I guess, was sometime end of May because I wasn't home very long, shell shock condition, naturally. And eight days later, I find out in a motel with this lady, and she says I got married. And to this day, I think I have a claim to sue her for sexual harassment. <laughs> I was married about nine years after I got back to the States. Exactly. So it was June 9th, so I got back around 8.30s, around that time. But I basically, around about a quick story, I mean, there's a lot of other individual instances. Some is even humorous, believe it or not, look back. Uh, but I uh, can't relate anything off the top of my head further. Uh, were you, you were, obviously you were a member of what they call the Caterpillar Club? Oh, yes. Yes, I have uh, the gold pin with the red ruby eye, mm -hmm. where I wear, I, use, I wear my uniform. I still am active with the military. It was in '76 when I uh, was in. I put it to retired, retired uh, for the military after some 30 years with active in reserve time, 1976. For the last 12 years, I've been I've been the uh, president of the Reserve Officers Association, Chapter 37 of Queens, and it keeps me, what keeps my fingers in the pot, so to speak. I understand what's going on. I have a youngest son who's a Marine Corps bird colonel active duty to this day. He was down, signed down to Quantico and the Pentagon. He's a highly decorated officer. Hopefully to see him up the rank maybe in the near future. Uh, to pick up the, the gauntlet, so to speak, with my other son, who retired as a bird. He's still a bird colonel, and I'd like to see him get a star someday. But uh, <clears throat> My daughter, she had multiple sclerosis, so she couldn't get into service. I wanted, I wanted the whole family. I wanted her in the Navy. And I'd have the whole, the whole, whole damn family in service. And I'm very happy I stayed with the military to this day, as I'm active with what I can do for the, our cause, so to speak, the greatest nation in the world. And what else can I say? Uh, Let me ask you a couple of questions. Your, your bomber, um, did it have any kind of nose art? On it or? Uh, no, it was on the silver media. Yeah. Uh, yes, but it wasn't wasn't any flamboyant, petty girl type of situation. Because mm -hmm. the nose off was on prior. The flame was already named. Yes, right. You said that. But actually, actually, the plane we were shot down on was not that plane. Because the previous mission, it had been shot up too badly. Uh, oxygen tanks blew and the. the Bombay doors were blown off, so they gave us a brand new plane. It was on its first mission, and to this day, I was amazed. I don't even didn't even remember that it was given a name by my uh, the enlisted men were given the option to name the plane. And frankly speaking, at that time, I wasn't really concerned with names or what, and they named it the Mighty Katrinka, which I didn't know until about three years ago. I'm embarrassed. Went out to Tucson, Arizona to a reunion of the 390th Bomb Group, and there was my good old friend Ray Hutt, who was the waste gunner. And I kept saying it was Silver Media. I said, well, oh, we weren't shot down in Silver Media, but I kept calling the new plane of Silver Media. He said, no, we named it the Mighty Katrinka. Where'd that come from? He told me some Russian friend of his or something, I don't know. But that's to be honest, and there was no nose arc in the plane. It was a brand new plane. Had nothing on it. it was brand new. Do you ever have any decoration on your jackets? You know, decoration on your jackets. Well, some 
units decorated their jackets. The well, their jackets. the A A two B four A two jacket, the leather jacket, mm -hmm. was stolen from me in England when I went up on a mission. Because when you went up floor on a mission, you didn't fly with a flimsy jacket. Yeah. You went up those days. Had no heat like you have today. Oh, hold Please on for a second. Up. I have to change tapes. Um, one other question. Um, <clears throat> while you were a POW, did you receive any medical a treat, a treatment at all uh, for your wounds? I would say months after I was in captivity, uh, at, no, I was more in Mooseburg, so that was down after we moved, I complained about frostbitten feet because we had that tremendous march. My fingers were all frostbitten, nose, my ears. Fortunately, they didn't fall off, I mean, but they were all black and cold. And they said, well, nothing could be done about it. I had some infections, some massive boils. He said, leave him alone. Whether he was a doctor or not, I don't, I couldn't swear. I imagine he was some medical man. And he said, they'll come to a head and let the pus come out. Which is exactly what did happen. He's a good doctor. Don't touch, take two aspirins and call me in the morning. I mean, just leave it alone. Because the sanitary conditions in the second camp was nil, it was zero. Whereas in, in, in uh, Saigon, up in first, you had every, uh, every two weeks or so, you, <coughs> they let you go out and take some water. And you could wash with cold water in winter time. You don't stay out long, put the water on your back at the end of that. And there was nothing like that down in Moosburg. We went back there twice, because my son, <coughs> the army man, was stationed in Mannheim and in Nuremberg. And from there, we drove down to the see the old campsite. <clears throat> First time I went there, believe it or not, they, the Germans had renovated the, the buildings that were originally there and made a knitting mill out of them. And the second time I went back, they were pretty much abandoned. But they do have, which I don't have a picture of it, <clears throat> a monument to the, those prisoners of war that died in that area in, in Stalag of the 7A. But that, as far as the treatment, the, the medical treatment, I have to say really negative, but I, I was able to fix myself up, the lacerations, the lacerations, they healed, uh, head lacerations healed, I washed them, cleaned them. Matter of fact, when I landed, I, I had two or three packs of sulfur powder, I poured that into the wounds, I put the bandage on, I was a good looking guy at the time, and made the nice crutches that some guy probably used them to this day, uh, might be sold them at some flea market, I don't know. But, How would you say the, your service had an effect on your life? <clears throat> well, from the first week I got back to the States, <clears throat> the change that was in my composition was, I think a lot of it was psychological. There has been a night since I came back, to my knowledge, that I haven't dreamt two, three, four different dreams every night for the past 55 years to this day. Prior to that, I never dreamed. I don't know if it was a dream. And I can recount and remember the dreams and I relate them to her. There's always a dream. It's like going to bed as an adventure. This goes back on a honeymoon. Or she see me on the floor walking. I think I'm walking in a prison camp or something. Or I'll jump back into bed or I'm hammering nails, breaking some boards. Later on I became a, before I went to the police department, when I, when I separated from the service, I was in the reserve, I separated, I became a carpenter, and I'd get up in the middle of the night, I'd be on the floor, with my fist nailing nails into the boards. Or I was flying in some sort of an opposite airplane. I'd be flying with uh, wooden wings. I mean, the stories were, uh, they were really attractive stories, because if I could put them into writing, uh, maybe they can make a motion picture out of it. But I relate them to her, and she's, ah, oh, you're kidding me. I don't know, what dream last night? And there it goes again. Or family, but a lot of time, atrocious dreams. Uh, not pleasant dreams. Dreams of uh, getting shot. Bullets coming through, but it doesn't hurt. Things of like that dream, but they're repetition dreams. They come back, come back, come back. And that goes back to say, to change my life, well, I had to be more cognizant of the situation when economically it was not good. When I came out of the service, the bottom line dropped, bottom fell out of the construction, and I entered the police department in New York City. <clears throat> I had no knowledge of police department activities or whatever it was. 
It was not pleasant salary. We'd like to take thirty-three dollars a week, twice, twice a, to pay twice a month, sixty-six dollars twice a month, and we'd be, get, be able to get just about to get by. And uh, it was a long struggle for the first several years until I promoted. Salaries came up a little bit, but the sleep situation never changed. It didn't affect my earning capacity or my my uh, capacity to think straight or uh, my actions as a peace officer, as a civilian. Uh, it was just a question the nights would never end to this day. Did Not you ever make, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? I made use of that to go to Delahanty's to get uh, some uh, uh, education regarding pre-police department uh, uh, examinations. That was the only, well, complaint I have with myself, really, that I didn't utilize that for college. Because I did have a year's credit prior in the military that gave me a, technically a year's credit for an escalated course at Washington State College. And we had just gotten married, and at that time, my first obligation, I thought, was to my lovely bride, who wound up getting pregnant thereafter. She was in a big hurry, you know. She, she, she wanted to nail me quick. But I, anyhow, uh, my time in the police department ended in 1968 when I retired honorably. And uh, I was off the position of director of security for Sears Industries, in which I remained there for 18 years, staying in the reserves all the time until 1976. I retired from Sears in 1986, and since, I was 62 at the time, and since that time I have been retired. And at age 62, I'm now 79, 78. <laughs> My wife is 79, see. A, I, I appreciate a more mature woman when I got married, see. Since biology in high school, she was after me. I don't know if she saw me anyway. Do you have any other yeah, I just have a couple of questions. Sure, right. uh, while you were a POW, were you locked up at night with dogs running through the compound, or the doors were secured? Absolutely, you were not out when those when they shut the power, no lights, all windows. No matter how cold it was, windows, not windows, they were wooden shutters, had to be opened. <coughs> Excuse me. Doors were secured. <coughs> you kept caught out at night. You. They, they, you heard shots, yes. yes. Were, were the uh, the barracks you were in, were they like off the ground, like on stilts? Absolutely. So you, so you couldn't uh, dig? Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, or some, some had some, what if, part of the foundation was up like a little bit, to, so you couldn't see all areas. And the digging was done very, very uh, clandestine-like way, surreptitiously done mm -hmm. uh, when they did it. And it's, if one would see that picture, the great escape was Stephen Queen. Mm -hmm. It was pretty much on target. It's how it was done, how how the ingenuity of the American people, the American servicemen, was to build, to make compasses, to make pots and pans, to make soup out of tin cans, and how they made their escape hatches under stoves, put water around. All these things were actually a fact. But yes, it was like you never went out at night. You had. Uh, in one area in the barracks there in Saigon, Starlight Grove 3, you had a pot there if you had to go to the bathroom for all your personal necessity. You never allowed out. If you went out, you're subject to getting uh, shot or something. And yes, there were guards would walk, goons they called them, walking with dogs, yes. Did you have a problem with uh, people, uh, fellow soldiers stealing from one another, or anything like that? <coughs> Well, I had heard of it in a, in, a, in a small compound. We had 16 or 18 men in this one room. Oh, not as big as this room. We had four tiers. Uh, we never had any problem of any theft because they dealt with very severely. Then the, the Colonel Speedy, who was the senior officer of the camp, Colonel Speedy, very staunch disciplinarian, real career officer. He would not tolerate it, and they meant no, they wouldn't tolerate it. You would have been dealt more severely than if the Germans had caught you. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there probably was, but it wasn't publicized really. Mm -hmm. The only thing that they would be about food, they would try. There was one man in charge of being a cook, like he'd handle food. And, and the dividing up a loaf of bread into 18 parts, 
he would never be allowed to pick first. He was allowed the last piece. I remember that just as a, a bit of a little shtick, so to speak. Seventeen men would get to take the biggest slice as they could. But he was so therefore he could never grab the first slice, the big slice. Whatever piece of meat, maybe the can of spam we had, sliced it eighteen times, he'd be the last one, so it had to be equal. His name was uh, Alan. Did, did you ever receive many um, Red Cross packages? Uh, in, in Saigon, yes, they came through. Now, they're supposed to come through parcel per week. When we got there, it was a parcel, one parcel for two men, and then one parcel for three men. They went to three men, then went to four men. As the Americans bombed the living daylights out of all railroads and everything, tracks, uh, the Red Cross had a heck of a time trying to get, get anything through, too. Not that I condemned the Americans doing their job, they did a hell of a good job. And the increase they did, the Germans did try to increase the soup or the black bread because to make up for the shortage of Red Cross parcels. And we were able to sustain not our weight. I believe I weighed 170 when I went in. I got out and they weighed me at uh, La Havre, France. I think I weighed 130, 132 pounds, which was good because I was a young man, didn't make it, was in good shape. <clears throat> then when we got to, uh, actually on the Force March, we were allowed to carry what we could. And we had to stretch that for that time, which we weren't sure how long it would take us. We never got anything hot until maybe at about 10 days. They got to some barn. And they put about three, four hundred of us up in some barn and the farmhouse. And I was on one of the details to go to the farmhouse and they give us hot water and with two German guards. And we got back to the, uh, the barn and we doled out the hot water because we had some powdered milk and some maybe powdered uh, coffee or something so they could make something hot. But then we got to Mooseburg. No, no rail uh, traffic was going at all. And then finally, the Red Cross was given permission, I guess, apparently by the Nazis, to bring stuff in by truck. And that's when we started to get some supply uh, of food, of Red Cross parcels, through Switzerland in that way. But even that was curtailed, because the last month in Mooseburg, man was scrounging anything that wasn't nailed down to eat. It was pathetic to watch them eating rodents, boiling up a rodent, uh, take the skin off the boiler and they cook it the best they can with the, with the portable stove, make portable stoves out of tin cans with a blower. Phenomenal how men would, how could make these things. And not that it's bad, you can eat them, as long as you boil them, cook the roll, it's good, you know. Whatever you could find, they'd eat. It was bad, the last two weeks was very bad down there. I'm privy, me, myself and another man, like, a lot of pictures I haven't got anymore, but I showed them later, uh, that was taken after our liberation. About 50 pictures to Why don't you uh, okay, so let me let me just ask one more question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, what happened to the guards when you were liberated? Did they just abandon the? <coughs> All right. The camp in Moosburg, Germany, the little story of a cassette told there. That was on April 29th. Early in the morning, we were told either get out of the barracks, whatever barracks that we had, barracks. They were tents. Mostly it was tents. I'm sorry, it wasn't it was tents? I'm sorry. Dig holes, and we went out. Just to climb on myself, dug a, a slit trench like, and we got in about that deep. And we heard this, first we heard cannons, we heard heavier 37 millimeter cannon or whatever it is. Then we heard small arm fire, then we saw maybe less than, oh, 20 or 30 P 51 circling over there. They didn't stop circling for at least two or three hours. What a wonderful protective. We were Air Force prisoners of war, see, they were separated from all the others. And here was the Air Force, our friends, our people, was hovering over, making sure that we weren't moved. Then came machine gun fire, then came a strafing, then came truckloads of the young neo, neo fascists the 16, 15 year old, the dangerous, dangerous young fellows. As they went by in trucks, they sprayed the camp. That I recall very vividly, just at random, you know, random fire. And this is one of the reasons why we all dug deep. There's only one, two people were injured, to the best of my knowledge. And then, before, before Patton came in, this was all during his time, the guards left the towers. Mm -hmm. Two or three of them, men, old men, probably in their 50s, 
to me, when they're all men, men. They walked over to us and say, for us, the war is over, for them. And they just like surrendered to us. But they were, I, we have no complaint of the German true military. They were soldiers, soldaten. They surrendered right then. And lo and behold, like this is prior to Pat coming in or the tanks coming in, one story, the Nazi flag is brought down in a big pole with a Nazi flag, and everybody's yelling and screaming, and up went an American tattered flag that was secreted somewhere along the line by some of the prisoners or made him. And you'd think there'd be a lot of jubilation, and this is for the record. You had maybe 2,000 American flyers there. As they raised the flag, you heard a pin, you could hear a pin drop, silence. And if the flag was lowered to the top and unfurled like to a man, they all saw this. And with dirty faces, tears rolled down their face, and not a sound was heard for maybe four or five minutes. It was the most solemn thing that a flag could do. People say to this day, what's a flag? It's only freedom of speech, you can tear it up. The flag meant to those men, these were hardened boys in their prison camp two and three years. Brought their hand up to a salute, slowly lowered it, and just tears came down. And finally they broke away, and then with that the excitement of the tanks rolling in changed, and that was the end of that. But it was a very somber, solemn moment in my life, which I'll never, never forget, and I've related to many an audience I spoke to at Memorial Day ceremonies, what the flag means to people. Again, there are many, many stories like this, but I can't recall them. Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't you um, show us some of the things that uh, Wayne uh, okay. is holding up with the camera and Wayne uh, uh, here, here, I have a picture here of myself in Bombardier School with a dear friend of mine. Can you hold it up toward the camera? I, know, it's, 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 I just took a look up the wall. Uh, I'm holding the bomb here. This is the 19, early, late, later, later 43, end of 43. And which one are you? I am this man on the right here. Okay. This is the victim of California that was Bombardier School. That was the dress of the flyers of those days. Okay. Okay, got it. Right, this is what a flyer looked like in those days. I don't know if you can see that. I can yeah, I can, I can focus. That's, can focus? Yeah, hold, hold it back at the distance. So. I think so. Now, when was this taken? Now, that was taken. Uh, this is taken also in Bombardier School, okay. 1943, uh, January. Oh, 43, uh, 44. Okay. This is a Washington State College. There's that jacket that you're talking about uh, that was yes. stolen from me. Yeah. Okay. I have a very, very proud photograph of me and my two sons. It was taken only three and a half years ago. Two colonels, I'm the old major. See, which one are you? You all look like brothers. Well, thank you. This, <laughs> this, this is me now. I still wear the uniform. This is a picture of myself getting the air medal. After 50 years, they finally sent me the air medal. I never had gotten it. I had the paperwork. And this is General Wuchak out in the Marine Corps was kind enough to award me that. My son was a colonel out there. And he gave me the award. How many missions did you fly? No miss missions. Not missions. Mm -hmm. You fly one mission and get your head blown off. And I'll tell you, people would say to me, as a matter of fact, I spoke to at the ex prisoners of war the other day, and people say, well, John Jones, uh, uh, he's complained about this and that, and I flew 17 missions. I said, well, maybe I flew 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a second. You flew 27 missions and you were shot down. You're in good shape for you. He only flew one mission. He's got two legs missing and his arm is shot up. But he only flew one mission. Compare yourself now. And by the way, 
very quiet. So the people say, no, not that your question, it's a good problem mm -hmm. question, but it's degree of the exposure at the time. And the people say, he was drafted, you didn't enlist. Well, even if the man was drafted, my humble opinion, his life was exposed to the security of this nation, and he did his job. And he, he put himself in, at risk. Mm -hmm. right? But naturally, I'm the best looking of the three. You know that. <laughs> uh, we, we got a few months? Sure. Well, you got this picture here. This, uh, this is, come on, I sent you a good picture. Yeah, we got this one. Oh, no, okay. Oh, okay. Well, here's, here's a picture of this guy when he was, well, gee, I was, to prove I was in the police department. I don't know if you want that. Okay, got it. This is my uh, my awards that were given to me, so you have a record of that. Oh, this is a copy for us. Huh? This is a copy for us. Yeah, you can have that. Okay, thank you. These are, these are actual photo, physical examination records showing I was shot down in uh, October 18, 1944, blown through the nose of the airplane stand. Mm -hmm. This here, if you like, this is the actual. I don't hide it. It's a bit it's bad Xerox copies. I have here a copy of this if you want. This is my anthology of the blowout that was put in the 390th bomb group. I authorized you to have it because I never signed over full restrictions to them. I kept uh, uh, dual uh, ownerships over to the story. <coughs> One mistake I corrected, it had they originally they typed up Copeland's, it's it was Castle. Mm -hmm. That, that you can have also. My wife says these articles here. Yes, she showed me. She showed me like that. Days when there was a camp I was in. A, I was liberated from. She was, she was desperately trying to nail me. You know that, guys. <laughs> I mean, she followed me into prison camp. You must have had some catch. Oh boy! I, she nods her head. I'm in the process of putting these photographs. I'm in the process of putting these photographs on the video, not video, but on the computer. My, my daughter just finished doing it. These photographs that you want, I'll have the copies sent out to you. These are actually photographs taken by myself and the friend of mine, Chester, of the, of the camps. But these are all these pictures were taken at the day of liberation. All these pictures. I, I think if your daughter is like in the archive, we'd love to have a copy of those. Oh, yeah, these we'd here. Be great. These here, you can't get any place. This is the, this is the boost bike to camp. This at the front. I have the key for this gate. Really? I was gonna bring it. I should have brought it. I got the key. Big, big sucker. I got the key. I went up. That's the only thing I stole from the government then. <laughs> it wasn't our government. <laughs> no. This is part of the camp here. I have all these photographs. I can get copies of them. Yes, yeah, because they're pretty small and they won't yeah, show okay. up. Okay. Yes, we greatly appreciate I that. Appreciate this interview. It was a good. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. So what is it going to be about?